So let's begin the lecture. Um, by now, you are supposed to have selected your indicators, chosen your dimensions, clearly chosen your purpose, and computed your deprivation matrix. So the lecture that we will be having in this hour, hopefully it's not going to be an hour and 45 minutes, but just an hour, because it's Friday, is something that we call association across deprivations. Some of you were asking me, I think, on, on also my colleagues. Yes, the light. Is it much better? Yeah. Otherwise, we will all sleep. <laughs> I don't like to fall asleep. Okay. So the title I, I was saying is association across deprivations. So some of you were asking me, what happens if you have highly correlated <coughs> indicators? That was the, the thing, right? Yeah. So uh, at that moment, I thought that maybe we should go back to the notion of correlation. So here the title says association, it's not saying correlation. Would someone would like to give me a, a hint why we are calling it association and not correlation? Why do we say association? Because we use We're using categorical variables, which are these deprivation indicators coded 0, 1, right? So in the case of variables which are not continuous, right, the dichotomous, maybe ordinal, correlation doesn't make sense. So that's why it's called association. Association is the general concept that looks at the relationship between two variables, not necessarily linear, simply how related they are, and not necessarily in a model framework, descriptively. So the purpose of this lecture is to give you some insights on how can you assess the redundancy of indicators of deprivation, whether these indicators perhaps are, me are measuring the same thing, perhaps not. So if you are not looking at correlation, we need to look at something else. Right? So this is basically the purpose of the lecture. So by now, we have defined our purpose. I am in group uh, Mongolia, yeah, with my group. <laughs> so we have our purpose, which is a national measure. Then we have the unit of analysis here, which is the household. And then we have our dimensions. And this, the same applies for all of other groups, right? So we have paused this morning. <coughs> we had had an interesting session with Adriana and learning how to compute these indicators. And then the deprivation matrix. We are still not maybe at the point of defining the deprivation cutoffs. Maybe yes, we have in our group. So that's where we are. So now we will pause again and then look at things related to these indicators by pairs. Right? So we could look at the selection of these indicators by considering maybe the association of them, how redundant they are, also, we can think about categorizing the indicators into different dimensions by looking at these relationships through associations. Or alternatively, we could use the same information for a third different purpose, which could be tentative weights for trial measures. So this analysis of association and redundancy is clearly important when designing a measure. We could use it for three different purposes, but maybe for other purposes. So it's something we need to do. So the redundancy will tell us essentially two things. Maybe the indicators are highly associated. Maybe they are not highly associated. What can we do with this analysis? Well, basically, going back to these three different purposes, we can either drop or modify the weights if, for example, they are highly associated. We can combine some of these indicators into a new sub-index or alternatively categorize them into different <coughs> dimensions. Hmm? Do you agree with me on this three? Mm -hmm. Maybe do you have other ideas of how we can make use of this association across deprivation indicators? Feel free huh, to have a discussion. Other ideas? Yes. Can you explain the third point? I've just looked at everything for conditions Yeah. So here we are only presenting today uh, in the uh, measures which are related to the association by pairs. And we will look explicitly at one, which is a similarity measure proposed in 1950. 
but we can also use other techniques, the ones that we are describing the first day of the lecture, which are these statistical methods, principal components, or multiple correspondence analysis that we were talking about. So clearly, we can have a factor you know, or a component that may tell us which indicators load similarly into the same factor. So maybe this terminology that I'm saying is not familiar. It's essentially saying that if we have many indicators and then we run a statistical procedure to see what's happening with these indicators, we may end up having a new variable that will tell us how related they are. And this will maybe give us an idea of the type of dimension that is behind these indicators. So that's why I'm saying categorizing them into dimensions. Is, is this clear? Can you give an example? For example, let's suppose we have the 10 indicators of the MPI. But we don't know whether the indicators on standard of living, access to water, access to sanitation, are truly indicators of standard of living. Maybe there is just indicators of the household. So if we have all these ten, indi 10 indicators and we apply a procedure, let's call it multiple correspondence analysis because all of them are dichotomous, we may be able to uh, ex extract from these 10 indicators other variables. These new variables will have a value and these values will tell us more or less how related they are. For example, from the 10, we may end up having six of them, which are the standard of living indicators of the MPI, that have a value, maybe negative value. No, it's just to say that it's a score. So for us, all negative values will reflect a dimension. Then the other three may load differently, and the other three differently, or two differently. So we will have the three dimensions. So these statistical procedures help to understand the dimensions behind. Clearly, they complement our normative considerations. We may end up having dimensions coming from a statistical procedure that doesn't make sense at all. So this is simply, if you want, a partial analysis that needs to be complemented normatively. Okay? Unfortunately, I cannot show you the PCA, which would have been an interesting exercise. We don't have time, but it's something we often do. That's why the demographic health survey has a wealth index in itself computed. So going forward, before we begin with the measures, it is interesting to um, basically remember the types of discussions that we have in the literature. There's people, exponents, that think that it's important to have high association when constructing indices. And these people feel that this high, high association is important whenever we are combining indicators in a marginal way. Who can give me an example of an indi indicator index that uses marginal information. Marginal means um, information by indicator, not, indi not information combined by pairs. The, a dashboard approach would be like, for example, what type of index that we know very well? Yeah. HDI, right? Or the famous human poverty index you know, that has been replaced. So in this, these two types of indicators, we are having information on each of the three, which was the proportion of people in education, life expectancy, and a third one, which are GDP by country, right? All of them are just then computed as a simple average. That's all. That's why it's called marginal, because we are only looking one by one, like in a dashboard. We are not looking at the proportions that cross, which would be more like a joint thing. So in this case, it's important to have high association. Because if they are not highly associated, then it means that the marginal, marginal distributions, individual distributions, are completely orthogonal, going into different dimensions. So combining all of them into a single number may not be that appropriate. So that's why high association is favored in the construction of these indices. Additionally, another reason would be to generate a robust measure. This means that if the indicators are highly associated, if we drop one indicator, the results will not change that much because they are highly associated. Hmm? Yes? It sounds like there's a, you have to negotiate a, there's a trade-off between um, association and redundancy. Yes. Is there a specific threshold, maybe a judgment that you can make? It's a judgment, as yes. you said. There's no threshold, mm -hmm. but there is a judgment, and there is a trade-off between how robust you want your measure and how redundant are the indicators. So this is one stream, people who favor high, high, high association. 
and this is cited in these books. For example, is there a rule of thumb? Or there is no rule of thumb, unfortunately. Okay. It is empirically based because it's normatively driven. It begins normatively, and then clearly, as we are all doing now, we are confronted to our data set. So it's, it's a two-stage procedure. Then we have low association. There's the other extreme of the, of the kind of thinking. And here, people think that high correlation or association signal redundancy. So clearly, if they are redundant, they should be dropped. They shouldn't be included in this, into the same measure. That's their view. So lo low redundancy may justify a multidimensional measure. In their view, there is this paper from these three authors and also this other paper from Mark McGillivray. So if you want to read them. This is simply to put into context the discussion, whether it is OK to have high or low association. And as you were saying clearly, we need a trade-off between both things, our normative considerations and what's <coughs> happening actually with our indicators. And mm -hmm. The challenge always we face is how high, how low is the issue, based on your experience. To what extent you are actually unknowing variables to correlate or associate? Well, in terms of correlation, if all variables are supposedly continuous, mm -hmm. we know that high correlation comes above 0.7. So from 0.7 to clearly 1 is high correlation. But that's not correlation because it's linear. When it comes to the association, we may have similar bounds, maybe not. And I will show you, when we talk about this redundancy measure, which comes from the literature of a similarity, that empirically, uh, Sabina has computed for many countries, the values do not go uh, over 0.8. And it's also bounded between 0 and 1. It's already high, 0.8. Hmm? Mm -hmm. So our view, and this is basically what I, we wanted to share with you, is essentially none or the other. So we are clearly neutral in the discussion. But we think, as we were saying, that this is a two-step procedure. It's always normatively driven, complemented by the statistical analysis that we are getting. And clearly, how, how robust we want to have our measures so that there's high association, but also how redundant are these indicators in the case of having high association. Hmm? So we're <coughs> in between both. And it's always clearly driven by normative considerations. So this is the discussion. Now it comes the measures. And for that, I need your help. If you have two deprivation indicators, which are dichotomous variables, which is the main instrument, the main tool, to represent the joint distribution of these two indicators? This is something you have been using already. The cross tape. The cross tape yeah? So is it clear for everyone why we need a cross tab? Yes, no? Yes. yes. yes? How many say yes? It's important because uh, this is the key thing. Don't be shy. Raise your hand. Who says yes? There's a few of you. <laughs> the question is whether everyone understands why we need that cross stuff to represent the joint distribution. Yes? OK, so in the case of dichotomous variables, we don't have the nice joint density, right? Is it clear, this idea of joint density, more or less? Yes? So it's like you have one variable here, one variable there, both continuous, and then the joint density is like a, it's like a bell-shaped distribution. Imagine something like this. So that will happen in the case of two continuous variables. But in the case of two um, dichotomous <coughs> variables, we don't have that bell-shaped, because the variable only takes on only two values. We cannot have that continuity. So the cross tab is useful, and the cross tab will help us understand two types of variables of the Alcar and Foster family of measures. One is the uncensored deprivation scores, and the other one is the censored deprivation scores. So who would like to give me a difference between the two? What is a censored and what is an uncensored deprivation indicator score? Yes? So uncensored includes all deprivations for all members of the society regardless of whether or not they're above or below the K threshold of, of poverty, multidimensional poverty. The censored, on the other hand, treats those who are not below the threshold of poverty as having 
zeros mm -hmm. and all deprivations, regardless of whether or not they actually are deprived. And so it only includes the deprivations for those who are multidimensional and poor. poor. Okay, very good. Do you agree with our colleague? Mm -hmm. Yes? So the <laughs> distribution of the uncertain deprivation scores is essentially the deprivation indicators we have begun with. No? So if we do not add up, we, uh, we have for each person a row vector, I mean a, a line, with zero ones, zero ones for each person, right? And then when it comes to the sensor ones, we will also have a line, but this line will tell us people who are deprived in each indicator, but at the same time multidimensionally poor. Yeah, you agree with me? So we have these two types of information, if you want. I'll explain the redundancy measure in terms of the deprivation variables, the, the indicator zero one, without including the notion of poverty. Okay? But you can do it also with the notion of poverty. And we will limit our analysis to present two things. One is the case of the equivalent of the correlation in the case of dichotomous variables. And the other one, which is the measure we propose and we are testing, is a measure of redundancy, which we call the measure of overlap. Okay? So these are the two things we will explore together. So before to be we begin with that, simply clarify what is the difference between association and the difference between similarity. Clearly, these two are written here. But uh, in your point of view, if I ask you about association, and clearly in the continuous case correlation, what do you understand from a number, let's say 0.3? A correlation of 0.3 tells you what? How would you interpret a correlation of 0.3? Linearly, linearly dependent on each other. 30%. Okay, there's a, okay, a correlation of 0.3. So it's telling you the strength, but it's also telling you the direction. So yeah. what does it mean, a positive 0.3 compared to a minus 0.3? So and, the and the other case, it's the opposite, right? Mm -hmm. So that happens with association too, even if it's not linear. But in the case of similarity, it's not the case. Similarity is not going to tell you the direction. It's go only going to tell you about the strength because it's looking at people who are similar. If you want a similar profiles across people. That's only thing, the only thing. So the matches between people. <coughs> These similarity coefficients in the literature are, I, I think they are vast. There, there's many types of measures in terms of similarity proposed in the literature. Clearly in this data, if you run the cluster command, if you want to group people, you can, fi you can find the different options. And within these options, you can find different similarity coefficients. So here, in this paper of 1982 from Hübelek, he surveyed 43 different similarity coefficients for binary data. So there's 43 different possible ways of looking at similarity. And these two intuitive ones, which are often reported also in the software, one is the simple matching coefficient, and then the other one is the jacquard coefficient. The simple matching coefficient would like to give me an intuition of what would that be. Thinking about a cross tab, you have the two indicators, 0, 1, 0, 1, and then we are trying to get this, co some, this matching coefficient from this cross tab. What would that be? Matching coefficient. Imagine a cross tab, 0, 1, 0, 1, and then the percentages mm -hmm. within each set. Is it maybe the proportion that's 0, 0, and 1, 1? Exactly. So the matching coefficient will look at that. Only at the proportion of people who are non-deprived in both and the people who are deprived in both. Just matching. And then the jacquard is a slight <laughs> variation of that one. Yeah, but the simple matching coefficient is the most intuitive. So this comes now to the same analysis that we were talking about before. Think about India. We have the row head count of child mortality and the row head count of schooling. Okay? So here we have 22% of children, uh, of households, who are deprived in child mortality, and 18% of them are deprived in schooling. But the crossing between the two is only 6.8%, 6%. 6% of these households are deprived in both. And then here we have the mismatches. It is in one, but not in the other. So this information, which is in a Venn diagram form, could be represented in this simple cross tab. Right? So here I'm not using India because we had huge I mean, number of people. 
It is a simple mock example. <coughs> and I would like you to pay attention to this very intuitive representation of the joint distribution, but has powerful information. Let's look at it together. So suppose we have child mortality and we have safe work, what we have been doing right now. Two possibilities, de non-deprived or deprived, non-deprived and deprived. Four people, non-deprived in both, three deprived in both, and then two deprived in child mortality but not in safe water, and one in safe water and not in child mortality, right? So these are the, if you want, the crossings. And here we have the totals, row totals and column totals, right? In terms of statistics, who does recall what is, how do we call these totals? And how do we call the cells in between? Marginal distribution. Marginal distribution are the totals, right? So if you want, is the row head count of child mortality is five, right? There's five people. And the row head count in state water is four. So these are the marginals in statistics because we're only looking at one variable, one by one. The joint distribution in this very simple representation are the four crossings here. So we have four possibilities, right? So joint distribution here, marginal distribution on the totals, on the margins, precisely. So in no notation, which is what we need now, we will denote non-deprived here, zero, zero, deprived in both one, one, and then the mismatches. So these are the matches on the diagonal and the mismatches on the opposite one. And here are the marginals, n1 plus, and then n plus one, which is this notation that we often use to denote summation. That's all very simple. So now it comes the information that we obtain from this cross tab. Clearly we have the matches, non-depriving both, depriving both, and the mismatches that happens just in one of the, of the variables, and then the marginal distribution. So this is the, if you want, the input variables that we have. And this is the information that is used for computing the correlation coefficient in the case of dichotomous variables that's called a Kramer V. Who's familiar with this Kramer V? Kramer V measure? Never heard of it. Well, this Kramer V is essentially the equivalent of the correlation coefficient that you have whenever you have dichotomous variables. So how is it computed? I will show you the formula. But first of all, think about that association will have these two things, strength and direction. But in the case of non-association, we will test it by independence, right? Have you, are you familiar with this independence thing, right? So whenever you have a cross tab, let's go back to the cross tab here, yeah? If they are independent, Maybe here. If they are independent, how do we expect to have these cells if these two variables are independent, not related? How do we expect them to behave? Zero, zero, zero. Zero, one, one would be. Uh, maybe, no? Zero. Maybe no crossings at all. It means that whatever happens with one, it doesn't really affect the other. So they are independent, <coughs> right? So independence could be tested in this cross tab through what's called the high square um, statistic, okay? So it's gonna test essentially a situation where we have this, which is our table, compared to a table under independence. So under independence, what happens with the joint distribution? Joint distribution that we have here. If you remember in the statistics. It should be the multiplication. A multiplication of the mm -hmm. marginals. Mm -hmm. So if we denote the joint distribution by F, X, Y, that would be equal to fx times fy, right? So that's, that's what happens in independence. So in this cross tab, this four would be equal to times five times six, which is not true clearly, no? It's, it's not true, we, 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 we see it's not true. And we do the same for each cell. Two would be equal to five times six, one, five times four, and three times, times four. We sum up everything and then we do a test. So that's how we test independence. We compare this table with a table that we reproduce under the assumption of independence. And this is how we see if they're independent or not. This will come with the, with the software itself. So in the case of correlation, we know that we cannot use this 
for the cutonous variables. And the measure that we use is this Cramer B. So I would like you now to take a look at this formula and tell me what you see from this simple expression from the cross tab. The numerator, what do we have in the numerator? Which is, what is N00? Zero zero? The, the matches, product of the matches, minus product of the matches. And in the denominator, product of the of the marginals, all four. Yeah? Marginal for one, marginal for zero, and then the same for the other variable, square root. You see? <coughs> so for computing the Cramer B, which is the correlation for dichotomous variables, a pair, we're using all the information of the cross tab, all of it. Which is interesting to see that if you go back to the numerator, here, we have the product of the matrix minus the product of the mismatches. What is this kind of operation in matrices? In matrices? Determinant. They're determinant, no? And what does it mean computing the determinant of a matrix? The determinant. More or less what information we get with a determinant. Uh, you know, the, the matrix has an inverse. In inverse or not, mm -hmm. right? So these properties that seem a bit boring and very simplistic are kind of powerful in, in the case of the dichotomous variables. It's simply to say that if we compute this Cramer B, which is the correlation measure, as our basis for assessing redundancy with indicators of deprivation that lead to a measure like the I Alcar and Foster, that is simply adding up deprivation, we may end up having a problem because we are using all the information of the cross tab. We are not only looking at people who are depriving both or non-depriving both, we are also looking at people that are depriving one but not in the other. In the case of the uncensored, which is this, the, the, this example, is maybe not that important. But when it comes to the case of censored, when we are looking at people who are poor and deprived, then we, we may end up having a problem. So going back to this Cramer B, we know that it would be uh, between minus one and one, like a correlation, giving us the strength and the direction of how related these two deprivation indicators are. So now, going now to the redundancy measure that we would like to propose to you, I invite you to take a look at this formula. And tell me what you see in the numerator and what you see in the denominator. What do we have here? The matches or coincidences in deprivation, joint deprivation. And what do we have in the denominator? Marginals. But the minimum. No? And what happens if we take the minimum? The smaller the denominator is, what will happen with the, with the measure in itself? It will increase, right? So what are we getting with this R0? Are we getting more or less like, a, like an upper bound of redundancy? You see? Why would we don't divide by the max? Because we could divide by the max. It will ju just give us the, the lowest estimate possible. But we are not interested in that. We are interested in that statistic that tells us how redundant these indicators are. So that's why we need to divide by the smallest of, of both. You agree with me? Yes or no? Who doesn't? Who's, who thinks it's not clear, this, this thing? If, if you could explain it again. Mm -hmm. So what, what part is not clear? The numerator, is it clear? We are having the matches in the privation. We are not looking at the mismatches, and we are not looking at the matches in non-deprivation, only at the matches in deprivation. And then we are trying to normalize those matches by something. Clearly, these need to be related to the row head counts of each of the two variables under consideration. So we have two possibilities. Either we divide by one, by this one, or by the other one, or maybe by a gap of, the, of both. That's also another possibility. But let's think independently, and we keep one of these two. Which one of the two row head counts shall we divide for, by? The smallest? or the biggest. So going back to our example, maybe it's easier. 
here. N11, the matches, is which cell of this table? Three. Three, Three right? Mm -hmm. So now we have a marginal here that's four, and a marginal here that's five. Mm -hmm. Shall we divide by four, or shall we divide by five? Four, According four, to the formula. Four. 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 four so the smallest, uh, right? So the smallest. Because if we divide by five, the ratio would be smaller compared to dividing three by four. Mm -hmm. You see? So the, the fact of dividing by the smallest of the two is giving us an upper bound of redundancy. Okay. That's what I meant. So the, if you want the, it, it will not go above that empirically, clearly. Mm -hmm. you know? Because um, theoretically, we could have a zero or we could have 100% of redundancy. So empirically, it would be only between these two values. Yes? One question. Wouldn't it be maybe interesting as a theoretical exercise to define the upper bound based on which of the two dimensions is heavily weight, more heavily weighted? That would be the case if instead of looking at this uncensored table, you look at the censored table. Because the censored table will incorporate the weights. This is unweighted. Okay. And we are doing this before, before doing the analysis of poverty. We are just looking at the indicators that you have selected the first day and trying to assess in what extent those indicators that we have picked are or not redundant or highly redundant. But wouldn't we be more interested in what if they're redundant among the people that are going to be excluded because they're not poor? It and also, you, you can run the same exercise. If you, if you already know who are poor, let's say we are at the second stage now of the identification, we know who are poor and who are non-poor. You can look at the population that is non-poor, and that by the focus axiom is, not co is completely not included, and then try to assess what's happening with the indicators also. Maybe that will help you redefine your measures. It's not exclusive of just one group. Hmm? Checking out redundancy between two uh, indicators or others, but Sometimes you have a redundancy by if you take two variables or three or more, and another one is going to be redundant by the composition of, of those of those two of those two or, or more. Yes. So in that case, it requires a multivariate st technique. This mm -hmm. is bivariate. Okay. This is by pairs only. So it's limited in the sense that it looks by <coughs> pairs. But if you are trying to assess the joint distribution of a three, four composition of variables then you need to go to the statistical techniques, because otherwise it doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. So is this clear, this little formula? Mm -hmm. How do we interpret now? Help me in understand what we are doing. We are dividing the percentage of matches by the smallest row headcount. So how do we interpret that? Let's say we get, I think I had an example, a true example. Maybe here. <coughs> Yes, let's say we have, I mean, here's the meaning, but let's go to this one. Let's say it comes 90%. We get a 0.9. How do we interpret that? It means that the ratio between the matches and the smallest row headcount is 0 0.9. What does it mean? It's written, but how, what does it mean? It's a kind of mechanic, right? So there is one problem. If mm -hmm. you have said that uh, lowest headcount are also deprived in other indicators, when it is coming from the row total, mm -hmm. then it's counting the deprivation of the indicators. Mm -hmm. But when it coming, it's coming from the column, column total, total, then it's coming <coughs> how many of the people. So there are two different things. Well, I would say that in this, let's go back to this simple example. Here, no? We know that there's, let's say it's 10, no? 40% <coughs> of people is deprived in this one, and here is 50% of people, no? So I will give you an interpretation which I always feel to me is more comfortable, which is a conditional interpretation. Given that we have 40% of people deprived in water, here, 30% are deprived in both. Three divided by 10. Instead of looking at the absolute value in percentage. 
So the redundancy is telling us that within this universal population that we are looking at, which is the smallest, here 40%, deprived in safe water, among those deprived in safe water, 30% are also deprived in the other indicator, which is child mortality. That's why it's redundant. So within the universe of the smallest, which here is safe water, 40%, 30 percent is deprived in both indicators, not only the one that we are looking at as the basis for comparison, but also the other one. Something it is an intersection here. Clearly, there is an intersection, intersection between deprivation here and deprivation here. So we are looking at the joint deprivation <laughs> compared with the smallest of all possible deprivations, these two, by pairs, clearly. Hmm? Is this clear? What, what about the other extreme? What, what is the implication of um, zero redundancy for? Re zero, 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 when we will get zero in the formula? When the when is zero. Zero. So what does it mean? <coughs> no matches at all. Yes. <coughs> it means no redundancy. What's the, is there any implication for the measure? Yeah, we do mean they are orthogonal. Yeah. I mean they, are the, they are measuring completely different things. Okay. Which, if it's, for example, education and the other one is health, then we are happy because they belong to different dimensions. Okay. But if it's education indicator one and education indicator two, this means that you could keep either of the two in your measure. Because they are completely independent. So it would mean if you take one mm -hmm. or you take the other, it's up to you to decide on a normative basis. So that means either... No redundant at all. Either, either extreme of, the, of that test implies dropping one in favor of... It would be dropping one. Okay. Or maybe including both because they are completely non-redundant. They are looking at two different completely aspects of education. Okay. There is zero redundancy, no <coughs> redundancy at all. And if they are two indicators of education, then both are looking at two different aspects of education. Or well, maybe applying to different uh, populations. Completely different populations. You see? And when we will have one? When we s will this formula will be equal to one? One of the cross, uh, non, uh, off diagonal terms is zero. Zero, right? So we will have four here divided by four, mm -hmm. and then this would be zero. So it means all population is deprived. In that case, and I think you have been already analyzing your data sets, mm -hmm. when you had a high proportion of people centered in one of these cells, it was telling you that there was something happening with that indicator. Either it is a really good indicator of, the, of what's happening in the country, because everyone lacks that, or it, perhaps it's the completely the opposite thing. It's not really a good indicator of poverty in itself because everyone lacks of that. You know, you are, you are basically in those extremes of, of situations. So that's why it's useful to look at this simple ratio. Hmm? That's theoretically. But now I will explain you why empirically the Cramer B measure is not useful. And I will show you with a couple of examples. <laughs> so let me look at that. Example, okay? So this is real data set coming from the DHS of Mozambique. Mm -hmm. So this is the cross tab for sc school attendance and years of schooling. <coughs> Again, non-deprived, deprived, non-deprived, deprived, non deprived, deprived. And here are the matches, 16% deprived in both. Row head counts, <coughs> here 38% deprived in one, years of schooling, 31% deprived in school attendance. No, look at it. So this is it. Our Cramer B measure, our correlation measure, will use the determinants, so the product of 47 times 16 minus 22 times 14, numerator, right? And then we will divide by the product of 68, 69 times 30, uh, 38 times 61, square root. And we get a correlation, Cramer B, of 0.19. So now the redundancy measure, matches would be 16% divided by the smallest of the two headcount ratios, this time school attendance. So this means that we are <coughs> looking at the universe of people who are deprived in the school attendance, 31%, and among these 31% of people, given that they are deprived in the school attendance, 16 are also deprived in years of school. Okay? 
Is this clear? Okay, so we get 0.5. What happens now if we go to a completely different example, which is this Bangladesh example? So this is the first table that we just looked at, Mozambique, and this is Bangladesh, okay? So let's look now at the frequencies. Look at the frequencies. Look at the matches, 5%, 16%. Look at the row head counts, 15, 19, 30, 38. Different. <coughs> you agree with me? These tables are completely different. Mm -hmm. Yes? What are these two variables? By the way, one is attendance, school attendance. The school at the same as before. And the other one was. Schooling is in terms of years? Yes, years of schooling. And this was school attendance. So schooling is a kind of variable. And the other is this a school attendance, whether the child is attending school or not? And the other one is years of schooling. How many years of schooling you have? One maybe is a popu at the adult level, the other one is at the child child level. The two, two different indicators we often use in the construction of the MPI. So schooling, uh, schooling is also dichotomous. Non yeah, yeah. Schooling is also Yes, all of them. Is, uh, this is going back to what was presented in the global MPI. Uh, a household is deprived in years of schooling if, okay. no? A household is deprived in school attendance if, and then you have the criteria. But this could be any other, any other two indicators. It is simply to illustrate why the correlation coefficient doesn't work very well. So look at this. They are completely different. Huh? <coughs> so now the values. We had this for Bangladesh. And this, is, and this was for Mozambique. Mozambique, we had 0.19 and 0.53. So now, for Bangladesh, it is 0.19 is exactly the same correlation but clearly a different similarity measure. So my point is, you have a completely different cross-tuff between the two countries. You have a completely different situation of school attendance and schooling, and you still get the same correlation value of Cranberry D, which is 0.19. It happens because of interchange. You interchange these two mm -hmm. diagonal elements and the same. Yeah. But these are two countries, completely different countries. It wasn't, a, if you want, a, an exercise made on paper. It's a completely different data set. And it's t telling you that the association is the same when the matches are completely different so and the marginals are different. So when you are doing the redundancy analysis, you are actually focusing on the deprivation exactly. matching. Exactly. And not the, I mean, not this the side matching, that side matching, both are possible. You are truncating that part. <coughs> exactly. Because of this focus axiom again, which is basically the one in which we're interested in identifying the port. So we only look at the joint deprivation, and then we try to control that if you want to normalize by something. And this something has to be one of these row headcounts. It could either be the smallest or the, or the greatest, but we prefer the smallest so that we get an upper bound. Okay? So this is the measure we, we are using to assess redundancy in deprivation across deprivation pairs of indicators. And clearly, we always compute the Cramer V to see what's happening. Maybe we can get some information from this in terms of maybe the, the, the strengths. I don't know. So let's go for an exercise. Do you agree with me? <laughs> Otherwise, it's a bit theoretical, right? So if you see on Dropbox, we have a do file here which is the do file that Adriana showed you this morning. Do you have it? So the title of the do file is the same. It says version 2 instead of PB. Huh? It says version 2. It says AF in Stata version 2 instead of what's written there. It's the same. Uh, it should be Stata. Version 2? Yes, everyone? Version 2? Yes. Okay. So. V2, yes, V2. So here, how is this? We have the code for running this. You can begin and run from this line, clear. So you open the data set, which is not the one that I'm showing here, but here in green, with use, pack, blah, blah. So you can select from here. 
two line line 87 the same data set as this morning which is Pakistan no you had a data set from Adriana this morning yes here says PAC DHS right I think she showed two no but anyways this data set should be there because I checked it. I also have access to Dropbox as you, so the data set is there. Yes, it is. Data set is this one. Yeah. We just have to change the directory. Change directory, yes. By now, I, 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 I assume that you know all that. Huh? But if not, you can just go here and say file, open, and then the data set. Okay? I can explain the code. Who would like me to explain you the code? Raise hands. Okay, all of you. Okay. So let's go to the do file then. Here, try, try to make it bigger. So if you download the data set, you just need to run the code as it is, changing the directory. And here is line, here, line 94. So we begin, I'm go just showing you the code of how to do this Kramer V and how to compute the R measure. So we can do it do two ways. Uh, one possible way is simply to tabulate the two indicators and then ask Stata to report the Kramer V measure. Okay, so <coughs> this is purely automatic and we can do that. The second way is to compute each of the elements of the cross tab, which is what I'm giving you here, so that you can understand what we are doing. But you don't need to do this procedure. Am I clear? Yes? So here instead, for example, if I go here, I can do tab, I don't know, two indicators. Let me pick two indicators, which would be, let's say, the nutrition, household nutrition, and schooling. I can do that. Then I can, I can say weight, which would be W equal weight. Okay. And that's it. That would be the table. Okay. <coughs> I can do the same, but I would like percentages, and I would like the Kramer V measure. So I will type all, okay? So this is more. Maybe I will make it smaller. <coughs> Again. Okay. So let me type again. So it would be no freq, so that no absolute frequencies are shown. Okay. So this is our cross tab for this country between nutrition and years of schooling, right? So the percentage of people depriving both is how much? 8%, percent, right? Depriving nutrition is 21%, depriving years of schooling, 26%, right? So the option no frac is simply not showing the absolute frequencies. We are only showing the relative frequencies. Option cell is given as these frequencies in percentage terms. And then all is giving you all the measures that we can obtain from this cross tab. Among this, we have what? The Kramer V, which is telling us that it's minus 1.76, right? So it's indicating what? Because it's a correlation. Negative, what does it mean? So what does it mean? That deprivation in, when deprivation in one increases, deprivation in the other decreases. Do you see that in the cross tab? Is that really happening? What do you conclude? Is it happening? We have a correlation of one, minus 1.76. Well, the sign is telling us that it's a negative relationship between both. Yeah. It doesn't look like that. Huh? So that's the problem. You see? The problem of using this measure as a guide for redundancy is that we are unable to explain why we're getting a minus. But mathematically, we know how it is computed. 
But for those kind of as a, a analysis that you are doing, it requires going beyond just the simple descriptive number. So my problem is not with atoms. I completely agree with you that each of the cells are informative in itself, that there's 60% who are non-deprived in both, and within these 26, there is 17 who there is a mismatch. I completely agree with you. The issue comes that when you try to interpret this minus point, uh, I don't know how much, it's very difficult to explain what is this minus really mean to a policy maker. So that's the, the, the thing. But this is simply to illustrate how to, you can compute, obtain all the statistics, because variables are dichotomous. You can also compute the Kendall Tau, or you can compute some the, the, the gamma the measure. All of them, you can use them. But we do not use this. We only look at this one. Mm -hmm. And then clearly, if we want to compute the R measure, I, I have the code, you have the code. But what we will do here is very simple. What is the operation I need to do? What do I have in the numerator? So just the matches of the division. So that's how much? 8.38. OK, so 0 0.0838 divided by how much? 21.73. OK, 0 0.2173. So how much do I get? 40, 40. So there's a redundancy of 40%. So among these people who are deprived in nutrition, which is 21%, 40% are also deprived in schooling. Right? Mm -hmm. So this is the, the idea that's giving you. That's the, the value of the redundancy between the two, it's 40%. So it's below half. If you want moderately redundant. Okay? I, I did it just there. You see, it's very easy. You can do it in Excel if you feel more comfortable. I will do it in Excel. But I have given you the code to, to produce each by cell by cell, and we will give you a loop to run for all pairs of indicators. Okay? What I want you to simply to illustrate the possibilities that you have to try to assess redundancy. Others may like statistical procedures like principal components with, with continuous variables. Go for them. If you want to do with dichotomous variables, multiple correspondence analysis, go for them. Compute all of them, and then try to, to see what the statistics is telling you in addition to these descriptive measures. I'm not saying that this is exclusive and this is the only thing you need to do. No, you can compute many things, from the correlation, these are, and then these statistical techniques that we look at the joint distribution, yet not by pairs, but as a correlation matrix. Hmm? Yeah? Okay, so this is what I had to show you. I think the code is there, and we will give you the loop to compute for all pairs. Okay, so you need to program that. Okay, so I think we are done. If you don't have any other questions.